Go. Okay. In seventh grade science, we've been talking about all the six kingdoms, and we're going to talk. No, what do you want? All right. We're going to actually tell the kids. Think about the kingdom you know the most about, which is the animal kingdom. That's the kingdom you started learning about before you were in preschool. And what we're going to do is going to take all the animals that exist on this planet, but we're going to break it up into six smaller groups called phyla that the kids can understand. Now there are 22 members of the 22 phyla of animals, but we're only going to look at six. We're going to start out looking simple. So the first phyla is going to be the phyla cnidarians. All right, cnidarians. The C is silent. Well, what's so unique about cnidarians? You've experienced them if you have been to the ocean and seen one of these organisms floating in the water. The interesting thing about cnidarians, they show radial symmetry as a body plan. What does that mean? It means if you take the top part of this cnidarian and you flip him over and look at him, his entire body is arranged in a circle with a mouth in the center. Now, when you look at a cnidarian, you can see a top and you can see a bottom, but you don't have a head, you don't have a tail, you don't have a front, you don't have a back. But what's the coolest thing about cnidarians that distinguishes that phyla from all the others is that they have stinging tentacles. And these stinging tentacles aid in their ability to feed. So here's how they do it. Located on these little tentacles here are little tiny stinging cells called nematocysts. Here's what's cool about them. You go running into the water. The cnidarian was there before you were. And its tentacles sway in the water back and forth. And you just happen to come in contact with one of those swaying tentacles. Well, located on these tentacles are little tiny cells called, again, nematocysts. And they look sort of like this. Got a trigger here on them. And inside of that cell, there's a little poison sac with a sort of like wire type organ you know, organelle attached to it with a little barb on the end, your leg touches that little trigger hair and what happens is the little trigger hair opens up and out flies that little poison sac with that little dart attached, goes right into your skin and you feel it. That's the cool thing about cnidarians because they use all these little stinging cells to capture smaller fish or smaller organisms. It, that poison paralyzes them, and they'll take those little tentacles and they'll just stuff it right into their mouth and start to feed. Nothing to this organism, very simple, two cell layers deep, no internal organs, not highly complex whatsoever, and that's the first phyla of animals that we looked at. Second phyla of animals is the phyla known as Anelida, Latin for annelids. Now, we know these because we've all seen earthworms before. And what's unique about this phyla is that their bodies are tube shaped. And the other cool thing about them is that they are segmented. They have no internal skeletal structure, and just like cnidarians, they're classified as invertebrates, which means they have no skeleton, they have no hard bones, but earthworms do have a mouth located at this end. They do have five hearts. They do have a crop. They have a gizzard, just like a bird. They have intestines. And you might have heard people say that if you take an earthworm and chop it in half, you get two. No, if you take an earthworm and chop it in half, you get a dead one. So, what they actually do is in through their mouth, they ingest soil. And out of that soil, they pull out decayed plant and animal parts. That gets digested and broken down in their crop and their gizzard. And if you've ever noticed on the outside of an earthworm, there is a little area, oops, sorry, ignore that, 
that sort of looks like it's smooth. Well, that's actually a site where they reproduce. But from that site almost all the way down internally through the rest of this earthworm is one long intestine. So whatever dirt they ingest here, they actually want to know, poop it out the end down here. And because of this phyla of organisms, the top part of our soil is churned over or aerated so that plant roots can actually get down in the soil. So unique characteristics of this phyla, long tube-like bodies divided into segments. They do have internal organs, unlike the jellyfish that do not have internal organs. And both of these phyla belong to invertebrates. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more complicated and we're going to get a lot more organisms because the next phyla is actually going to be arthropods or arthropodus. Now, example of an arthropod. Where are my arthropods? Examples, examples. Here we go. This, these are arthropods. Scorpions. What's so unique about a scorpion? Scorpion number one. Scorpion number two. The partial shell of a horseshoe crab. A, a butterfly. And if you think about wonderful lobsters and crabs and shrimp, they have hard exoskeletons. They're still classified as invertebrates. They don't have any bones on the inside but hard exoskeletons on the outside, and they also have jointed appendages. Think about a crab leg. If you think about a crab leg, it's got joints, just like your wrist or your elbow or your shoulder, and they can actually use them somewhat like you can. Smooth, not smooth, but sort of jagged type reactions. Um, arthropods have highly developed systems. They've got excretory systems, digestive systems, but the cool thing about arthropods is they're found in all environments, on land, in the water, fresh water, salt water. We sometimes refer to them as crustaceans, and here's what I tell the kids. The next time you decide to eat that little sand vein along the back of your shrimp, you need to stop and think that that's the intestines the brown stuff is poop, the crunchy stuff is sand. That's why sometimes when we bite down on these things, that's what we actually put in our mouth. But remember, exoskeletons. You step on an arthropod, it's going to go crunch. All right, next phyla is going to be the phyla Echinodermata, or Echinoderms. Echino means spiny, derm means skin probably the most familiar are going to be the starfish. Now, like cnidarians, which are jellyfish, if you look at these organisms and if you turn it over, there's a mouth right here in the center. And if you were to take your finger and follow each of the arms of the starfish, the shape you would ultimately wind up with is a circle, radial symmetry. They have a top, they have a bottom, but there's no head. You can't tell the front from the back. So these guys are radially symmetrical. They actually operate on a system of hydraulics. They use water inside their body to move the millions of little tube feet that if you've ever picked up a real starfish, you notice on the bottom. And one of these guys actually has dried tube feet on the bottom. Um, and this is how they actually move. They move along the bottom of the ocean or up along, you know, ledges or rocks or outcroppings or even other shells by moving the tube feet. They are carnivores. They actually go after and eat meat. Hold that still for a second so I can zoom in on those tube feet. Got it. That's close. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right. Another example of an echinoderm is a sand dollar. Sand dollars, again, just like the starfish, show radial symmetry. They're not complicated organisms at all. 
they do have a stomach, they do have, you know, a, a digestive system, they do have a few internal organs. Um, the cool thing about when they eat, starfish will actually eat the next group or phyla, which are mollusk or mollusca. Now, what makes echinoderms different from mollusk? Mollusks are soft-bodied animals that actually have a shell, all except for the octopus. Now, what will happen is when an echinoderm gets hungry, it will actually encounter a shell. Now, this is only one half of a shell. But what it will do is it will go up on top of this clam, oyster. This is actually a quahog. It's a type of clam. And it will take its tube feet and hold on to the shell. Now, what I want you to imagine is there's another half to this shell. What the starfish will do is go up on the shell with its tube feet, and it will slowly wrap its body around the shell. And what it'll start to do is slowly apply enough pressure to pull the shell apart. It doesn't care if it takes an hour or two. It's got all the time in the world. It'll slowly pull the shell apart. And then what it does is it sort of like regurgitates its stomach out of its mouth, It'll slide its stomach down into the shell and start to digest the clam directly. And so that's what they actually do. That's how they actually feed. And if you want to look at a couple more echinoderms, um, here's one. I had a sea urchin somewhere. Sea urchins with their spines. Um, here is just the skeletal remain. Sea urchins are exactly like the starfish, radial symmetry, mouth in the middle, and here is the top part. So again, simple organisms. The next phyla is the phyla mollusca. This is a helmet shell, and you can just imagine the size of the organism that had this shell as part of its body. Um, if you and I were to actually see this animal, it would be a very soft-bodied organism that would probably look like a very large, overgrown snail. Um, they are born with their shells. Their shell is just as much a part of their body as your skeleton is to you, except they wear it on the outside of their body. They're also classified, just like the starfish, just like the arthropod, just like the cnidarians and the annelids, classified as invertebrates. They have no internal skeletal structure. Well, if you run up and down the beach collecting seashells, you're actually picking up all these different kinds of mollusks. There are mollusks that have one shell, like this one. They're called univalves. If you look at a mollusk where it, this is only one, but it does have another half to it, this is called a bivalve or two. We like to eat mollusks. We like to eat the soft bodies of these organisms. Um, examples are clams, oysters, mussels. Um, lots, some people actually eat conch shells. Uh, little quahog clams. Those are all examples of mollusca. I could tell you some cool things. Uh, the other thing is um, squid and octopus. They're also classified as mollusca as well as cuttlefish and nautilus. And sorry, but there's a video clip on those. I don't have any samples for those. And the last organisms, which are the most complicated, are the organisms that belong to the phyla chordata. Well, chordata means that there is an internal skeletal structure and vertebra. Now, here's a vertebra. As I'm facing you, this is what the vertebra would look like. And if I turn around, this is what the vertebra would look like. And if you bend over and feel the little spines, that's going to be these parts here. But what's so important about chordates is right down the middle of these vertebra in this skeleton, it's a hollow area, but if it were real, it would be a spinal cord. Good afternoon, students. All students okay, going to the going. Atlanta trip with Cora. Okay. Please see the spinal today cord after school. That has a, it's a bundle of nerves in a sac filled with fluid. These are highly organized organisms. They have a brain. They have internal body parts. Here is a 
tiny little hummingbird that gave its life for science. This is a red-throated hummingbird. Um, respiratory systems, digestive systems, excretory systems, reproductive systems, teeth, muscles, bones. Um, here's the difference between an herbivore and a carnivore. Most of the organisms the kids are familiar with are chordates. Birds, fish, reptiles, frogs, toads, all the good stuff. Bye. And don't tell me.